of the worst acts of violence in American history in the city of Chicago on February 14, 1929. A terrible massacre happened. The massacre was a cruel and planned act of violence that still scares people today as a memory of the bad things that happened in the 1920s. In today's video, we will explore the history of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, examining the events leading up to the killings, the massacre itself, and its aftermath. We will also take a look at the key figures involved in the massacre, including Al Capone Bugs Moran and Jake Guzik. Let's get right into it. Between 1920 and 1933, there was a prohibition era. During this time, the 18th Amendment made it illegal in the United States to make, sell, or move alcoholic drinks. But this didn't stop people from wanting alcohol, which led to the growth of speakeasies and the formation of strong crime groups. At that time, Chicago became a real hotspot for organized crime. It was pretty intense, with big names like Al Capone running the show. Capone, also known as Scarface, was quite the character. He was the tough-as-nails boss of the Chicago outfit, a major gang involved in all sorts of illegal activities like bootlegging and gambling. And on the other side, there was the Northside Gang, led by George Bugs Moran. The rivalry between the Chicago outfit and the Northside Gang was so intense, it later escalated, fueled by territorial disputes, power struggles, and, of course, the lucrative illegal alcohol trade. As tensions between the two gangs reached a boiling point, the stage was set for a violent and unforgettable event that would go down in history as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So, how did this infamous incident unfold? Seven members and friends of Chicago's Northside Gang were killed on Valentine's Day, 1929. This unfortunate incident later became known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Boys, uh, something I can do for you? Yeah, you can shut up. <laughs> I'll line up all of you, face that wall. Uh, you, over there! On February 14th, 1929, early in the morning, the guys got together at a garage in Lincoln Park, Chicago. Four people, two of whom were dressed as police officers, lined them up against a wall and shot them. The killings happened because the mostly Irish North Siders, led by George Bugs Moran, were competing with the mostly Italian Chicago outfit, led by Al Capone, to be in charge of organized crime in the city. The killers have never been proven to be certain, but former members of the Egan's Rats gang who worked for Capone are thought to have been involved. Some people also say that members of the Chicago Police Department who wanted to get back at someone for killing a police officer's son, played a role. On February 14, 1929, at 10.30 a.m., which was Valentine's Day, seven men were killed at the garage at 2122 North Clark Street in the Lincoln Park neighborhood on the north side of Chicago. They were shot by four guys who had two Thompson submachine guns with them. Two of the shooters were dressed like police officers, and the others were dressed in suits, ties, overcoats, and hats. Witnesses witnessed the men in police uniforms leading the other men out of the garage at gunpoint following the incident. Five people from George Bugs Moran's North Side Gang were among the dead. Abel Kachelik, also known as James Clark, was killed along with Adam Heyer, who was the gang's bookkeeper and business manager. Albert Weinshank, who ran a number of cleaning and dying jobs for Moran, and Frank and Peter Gusenberg, who were gang guards, Two other people were also shot. Reinhard Schwimmer, a former eye doctor who became a gambler and gang member, and John May, a mechanic who sometimes worked for the Moran gang. When Chicago police got at the scene, they saw that the victim Frank Gusenberg was still alive even though he had been shot 14 times. After being transported to the hospital, he was stabilized by medical professionals for a brief period of time while the police attempted to question him. When the police asked him who did it, he reportedly said, I won't talk, for God's sake get me to a hospital. Three hours later, he died. The massacre was basically an attempt to get rid of Bugs Moran, who was the leader of the North Side Gang. Al Capone, who was at his Florida home at the time, was pretty much believed to be the one who ordered that massacre. It seems like the reason behind the plan might have been the North Side Gang's decision to steal some pricey whiskey that Capone's gang was smuggling from Canada through the Detroit River. However, Moran was the last surviving member of the North Side Gunman. He had succeeded his equally aggressive predecessors Jaime Weiss and Vincent Drucci. 
who had perished in the bloodshed that ensued after the assassination of their original commander Dean O'Banion. The timing of the plan to kill Moran was influenced by a number of different circumstances. Moran and Capone were both trying to take over the rich bootlegging business in Chicago. Moran had also been moving in on a dog track run by Capone in the suburbs of Chicago. He had also taken over a few saloons that Capone ran, saying they were in his territory. Earlier this year, North Siders Frank Gusenberg and his brother Peter tried to kill Jack McGurn but failed. The North Side gang was also involved in the murders of Pasqualino Patsy Lalordo and Antonio the Scourge Lombardo. Both had been heads of the Unione Siciliana, which was the local mafia, and were friends with Capone. The plan was to kill Moran and maybe two or three of his aides at the SMC Cartage Building on North Clark Street on February 14, 1929. The Northsiders were probably drawn to the garage with the promise of a stolen, low-quality shipment of whiskey. This whiskey came from Detroit's Purple Gang, which was linked to Al Capone. It was planned that the Gusenberg brothers would take two empty trucks to Detroit that day to pick up two loads of stolen Canadian booze. All of the victims were dressed in their best clothes, except John May. This was the custom for the Northsiders and other gangsters at the time. By 10.30 a.m., most of Moran's gang had arrived at the warehouse, but Moran wasn't there because he had left his Parkway hotel room late. He and Ted Newberry, another member of the gang, were coming up to the back of the warehouse from a side street when they saw a police car coming up behind it. Right away, they turned around and went back the way they came to a nearby coffee shop. When they saw Henry Gusenberg, a member of the gang, on the street, they warned him and he turned around too. I'm already a rich man. And besides, I... Willie Marks, a member of the North Side Gang, saw the police car on his way to the garage as well. He ducked into a hallway and wrote down the license number before leaving the neighborhood. Capone's lookouts probably thought that one of Moran's men, most likely Albert Weinshank, who was about the same height and build as Moran, was Moran himself. It was even more confusing that the two guys physically resembled each other because they were both wearing the same color overcoats and hats that morning. People who were outside the garage saw a Cadillac car stop in front of the garage. Four guys came out and walked inside. Two of them were wearing police uniforms. With shotguns in hand, the two fake police officers went into the back of the garage and found members of Moran's gang as well as Reinhard Schwimmer and John May, who was working on one of the trucks. The fake police officers then told the men to line up against the wall and signal to the two people who were with them but weren't wearing police gear. They then opened fire on the men. One killer used a 20-round box clip and the other a 50-round drum to fire their Thompson submachine guns. They were very thorough, spraying their victims all over the place. They kept firing even after all seven of them had fallen to the ground. Based on the coroner's account, two shotgun blasts afterward pretty much erased John May and James Clark's faces. After they were done shooting, the two uniformed police officers pushed the guys in street clothes to come out with their hands up to make it look like everything was under control. May's dog Highball and Frank Gusenberg were the only ones who made it out of the building alive, even though Frank was hit 14 times by bullets. He was still conscious, but he died three hours later, refusing to identify the killers. The Valentine's Day massacre caused a public uproar that made things hard for everyone in charge of the National Crime Syndicate. Within days, Capone was asked to appear before a grand jury in Chicago on charges of breaking federal prohibition laws, but he refused because he said he was too sick to attend. Everyone knew that Moran was taking Capone's liquor shipments to Detroit, so the cops focused on the Purple Gang, which was mostly made up of Jews in Detroit. Many people also thought that the cops were involved in the massacre, which may have been what the killers wanted. Mrs. Duty and Mrs. Orvidson, who were landladies, had taken in three men as roommates ten days before the killing. The North Clark Street garage was right across the street from their rooms. Mrs. Duty? My friend here and me, we're looking for a nice front room. When the police asked them to identify the men, they chose mugshots of George Lewis, Eddie Fletcher, Phil Keywell, and his younger brother, Harry, who were all members of the Purple Gang. Later on, they changed their minds about who the men were. However, Fletcher, Lewis, and Harry Keywell were questioned by the cops and found not guilty. On February 22nd, the police were called to a garage fire on Wood Street, and found a 1927 Cadillac sedan that had been taken apart and partly burned. 
They were convinced that the killers had used the car. They traced the engine number, and it led them to a dealer on Michigan Avenue, who said he sold the car to a man from Los Angeles named James Morton. They also found out that a man named Frank Rogers rented the garage. However, the police couldn't find out anything about James Morton or Frank Rogers. Sometime later, the police got a lead on one of the killers. A truck driver named Elmer Lewis had hit a police car on the side just minutes before the killings. He told the cops that he stopped right away, but the uniformed driver, who was missing a front tooth, waved him away. Someone who witnessed the accident also said the same thing about the driver. The police were sure that the person they were talking about was Fred Burke, who used to be in Egan's Rats. Burke and a close companion named James Ray were known to wear police uniforms whenever on a robbery spree. Burke was also on the run because he was wanted in Ohio for robbery and murder. Police also thought that Joseph Lelordo might have been one of the killers because the Northside gang had just killed his brother, Pasqualino. Police then announced that they suspected Capone gunman John Scalise and Albert Anselmi, as well as Jack McGurn and Frank Rio, a Capone bodyguard. In the end, police charged McGurn and Scalise with the St. Valentine's Day massacre murders. However, Capone learned of a plan to kill him, so he killed Scalise Anselmi and Joseph Hop Junta in May 1929. The murder charges against Jack McGurn were dropped because there wasn't enough proof. He was only charged with breaking the Mann Act because he took his girlfriend Louise Rolfe across state lines to get married. The case went nowhere until December 14, 1929, when the Berrien County, Michigan Sheriff's Department raided the home of Frederick Dane in St. Joseph, Michigan. Dane was the registered owner of the car that Burke drove Burke had been drinking that night, and he then hit another car from behind and drove off. Patrolman Charles Skelly chased him and finally got him to leave the road. Even though Skelly jumped on Burke's car's running board, he was shot three times and died that night. The car was found wrecked and abandoned just outside St. Joseph and traced to Fred Dane. By this time, police photos confirmed that Dane was in fact Fred Burke, wanted by the Chicago police for his participation in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. When police searched Burke's bungalow, they found a big trunk with a bulletproof vest, two Thompson submachine guns, pistols, two shotguns, and thousands of rounds of ammo. The bonds had been stolen from a Wisconsin bank not long ago and were worth almost $320,000. The officials in St. Joseph told the Chicago police right away, who requested both machine guns. They used the new science of forensic ballistics to identify both weapons as those used in the massacre. They also found out that one of them had been used to kill New York gangster Frankie Yale 15 months before. Sadly, no new solid proof came to light in the massacre case. After more than a year, Burke was caught on a farm in Missouri. He was tried in Michigan and given a life term because the evidence against him was strongest when it came to the murder of Officer Skelly. However, in 1940, he died in jail. The Federal Bureau of Investigation searched a Chicago apartment building at 3920 North Pine Grove on January 8, 1935, for the last members of the Barker Gang. An argument turned into a short shootout that killed bank robber Russell Gibson. People like Doc Barker and Byron Bolton, along with two women, were locked up. Bolton was in the Navy and worked with Egan's Rats. He had also been working as a driver for Chicago hitman Fred Goetz. Bolton knew about many of the crimes committed by the Barker gang and revealed where Ma and Freddie Barker were hiding out in Florida. A week later, both of them were killed in a shootout with the Federal Bureau of Investigations. Bolton said that the St. Valentine's Day massacre was something he did with Goetz Fred Burke and a few other people. The Federal Bureau of Investigations didn't have any power over a state murder case, so they didn't tell anyone about Bolton's statement until the Chicago American newspaper printed a version of it that was passed along. Newspapers said the crime had been solved even though J. Edgar Hoover and the Federal Bureau of Investigations wouldn't let them work on the case of the killings. The news across the country reported Bolton's story in jumbled ways. It was said that Bolton said the plan to kill Bugs Moran was made at a resort held by Fred Goetz in Cotteray, Wisconsin. In October or November of 1928, gangsters including Goats, Al Capone, Frank Nitti, Fred Burke, Gus Winkler, Louis Campagna, Daniel Saratella, William Paselli, and Bolton were all at this meeting. The men stayed for two or three weeks making plans to kill their enemies. Bolton said that he and Jimmy Moran were told to keep an eye on the SMC cartage yard and call the killers at the Circus Cafe when Bugs Moran showed up to the meeting. The police later found a letter written to Bolton in the lookout nest. 
Bolton guessed that Burke, Winkler, Goats, Bob Carey, Raymond Crane Neck Nugent, and Claude Maddox were the real killers. The story Bolton told about the killing is different from the story most historians tell. He claimed to have seen only plainclothes guys get out of the Cadillac and enter the garage. So, this means that the killers used a second car. However, George Bruchet said he saw at least two guys in uniform get out of a car in the alley and go into the garage through the back doors. Bolton revealed that he thought one of Moran's men was Moran. He then called the circus calf to let them know what was going on. The killers were planning to kill Moran and two or three of his men, but when they arrived, they found seven men instead. They decided to kill them all and leave quickly. Bolton said that Capone was very angry with him for the mistake and the pressure from the cops it caused. Capone even threatened to kill Bolton, but Fred Goat stopped him. Georgette Winkler Gus's widow backed up his claims in an official Federal Bureau of Investigation statement and in her diaries, which came out in a four-part series in a true detective magazine in the winter of 1935 and 1936. She told them that her husband and his friends had put together a secret group that Capone used for dangerous jobs. They were called American Boys by the mob boss, who was said to have had complete faith in them. A police officer in Chicago, William Drury, who had worked on the massacre case long after everyone else had given up, also agreed with what Bolton said. Despite Bolton's confession, the FBI did not do anything. Most of the guys he named were dead by 1935. Only Burke and Maddox were still alive. A lot of mobsters were named as being on the Valentine's Day hit team. John Scalise and Albert Anselmi, two hit men for the Cosa Nostra, were two main suspects. People heard Scalise bragged, I am the most powerful man in Chicago, in the days after the crimes. Unfortunately, Scalise and Selmy and Ginta were found dead on May 8, 1929, on a lonely road near Hammond, Indiana. It is believed that Capone found out that they were going to turn on him. So Capone killed the three with a baseball bat at the end of a dinner party held in their honor. In 1995, Chicago criminologist Arthur Billick who had spent 30 years researching the massacre through Federal Bureau of Investigation's files and court transcripts, said that the people who took part were Capone goons led by machine gun Jack McGurn. Jack McGurn put together the murder team, which included lookouts Byron Bolton, Jimmy Moran, and Jimmy McChrison. Their job was to keep an eye on the garage and let Tony Accardo and the other triggermen know when Bugs Moran showed up. Bielek claimed that Claude Screwy Maddox was another part of the team, he got the killers a car that looked like one the police use. Once the scene was set, Capone and McGurn came up with the story Capone left for Florida, and McGurn and his wife Louise Rolfe checked into a hotel. The massacre was the start of the end for Moran's power. But with the gang members he had left behind, Moran was able to keep control of his land until the early 1930s. Capone and his crimes finally got the full attention of the federal government because of this event. It was this that finally brought down Capone, he was found guilty of income tax fraud in 1931. The massacre put an end to both Moran and Capone's bloody turf war, which had been going on between them. This crime never had a clear conclusion. Even now, it's still a real murder mystery. The gunmen were never caught, and Al Capone was never arrested for the crime. Al Capone did go to jail for seven years because he didn't pay his taxes. After he got out of jail, he went to Florida, but he died there in 1947 of syphilis. Thank you for watching this video about the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Hope you found it informative and thought-provoking. What do you think about the St. Valentine Day Massacre? Do you think it could have been prevented? Please leave your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and share it with your fellow history enthusiasts. Subscribe to Crime State for more riveting stories from the past. And until next time.